ready? Okay, our next presentation is by the Mars Exploration Team. Good afternoon, everyone. We are the Mars Exploration Team. I'm Gabby the Freak. I'm from Toledo, Ohio. My name is Eden Winga, and I'm from La Crosse, Wisconsin. I'm Sanjana Serrano, and I'm from Miami, Florida. I'm Maria Clay, I'm from El Paso, Texas. I'm Anna Morgan, and I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I'm Zoe Quinares, and I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm Kira Cromberg, and I'm from Bend, Oregon. I'm Nadia Mont, and I'm from Troy, Michigan. So to start, humans must explore. We can say that it's essential to our prosperity, and even arguably to the advancement of our species as a whole. For half a millennium ago, Magellan's expedition resulted in the first circumnavigation of our globe. 450 years later, in an entirely different expedition, man set foot on the moon. Every day, human beings strive to discover the undiscovered. We choose to set the path for generations to follow. And today, we can see a new path in our future. That is the exploration and expedition to Mars. Mars is our future. Over the past two weeks, our team has worked hard to develop the Asteria habitat. Our challenge was to design a surface installation that can support 14 people for 26 months on Mars. We worked to not only design, but actually build and 3D print a module that is safe, effective, and allows astronauts to collect the valuable data from the surface of Mars. We were limited by a few constraints, though. We aimed to contain waste and limit the mass that we brought on rockets. We were limited to about 130 metric tons for four separate launches. We wanted to keep the astronauts safe, healthy, and content on the planet, and save about 25 billion US dollars. We wanted to make sure that every detail was thought of from radiation protection to entertainment. And I hope that during this presentation, you'll get to see what we've been working on and how we aim to address these issues. This is a picture of the location of Earth and Mars as they are right now. Because of Mars' a slightly elliptical orbit and its the varying distances from Earth, there are only certain launch windows that we can send spacecraft from Earth to Mars. The following slide shows a, uh, an example of this trajectory. This trajectory, takes about six months one way. Because of the distance and because of the limited time frame windows, we had to determine how many spacecraft to send and to meet the requirements and deliver all our materials to the surface. So to illustrate our projected mission, we um, designed a diagram. So at the beginning, we will be sending one, SL one uh, SLS rocket and then we will be following by two more, and these will only be our cargo, such as our modules, our lab equipment, and such. And um, the cargo will take about six months to get to Mars, and because of the specific launch windows, um, we have time restrictions when we can actually launch everything, so we will be uh, launching one SLS rocket every 26 months. And on the fourth launch, we will be sending our crew on a Dragon Crew spacecraft, and then we will be staying 800 days on Mars. And then for return, we'll be coming back on a Orion capsule. So if Mars is so far away, and if it is so hard to get to, then what makes it worth it? Well, the benefit of Martian exploration is it really helps to encourage geopolitical and technological collaboration between nations. Much like the International Space Station brought together Russia and the United States, and along with other nations such as Japan, traveling to Mars would do the same thing and really encourage a globalized culture. Secondly, it really helped to satisfy the curious nature of mankind. That's such nature that has made exploring Mars a goal of international space missions since their foundation. The most important reason to explore Mars was the possibility of finding life. Finding life past or present would help, or the absence of that life, would help answer existential questions like, are we alone in the universe? Is Earth unique in its habitation of life? Or does life abound throughout the universe? And are, we, are, are we one of billions of planets with this situation? So that raises the question, if we are about to go to Mars, where on Mars should we go? So to choose our landing site, we first narrowed it down to five locations based on NASA missions and identified exploration zones. We then ranked these locations on a set of criteria, such as landing terrain and access to water. We then chose the midway point between Northeast Sirtis and the Jezero Crater, as this, ranked, as this was ranked highest on our list. This shows the location of uh, our landing site on the Martian surface. And as you can see, there's an area of exploration zones labeled in green circles around Jezero Crater and Neely Fosse. And we would have access to both with our rovers from our habitation site. The scientific significance of both of these, event, or both of these areas is first for 
Carnelian bauxite, there's evidence of plate tectonics, which as you can see from this graphic, reveals older sediments, making geological history more easily viewed. <coughs> and in the Jezero crater, uh, there's evidence that there is a preserved river delta, meaning that there will be a collection of minerals, and, also, and it will also be a possible location to find water or life. So after we found an exact location that we wanted to land our habitat, we had to do a Monte Carlo analysis. So our technology is not advanced enough to land on a precise dot on Mars. So uh, this analysis takes several variables, such as Martian wind speeds, and projects an ellipse onto the Martian surface. And there's a three sigma probability that our um, spacecraft will land within this ellipse. So we know where on Mars we want to go, and we know why we want to go there. So now that raises the question of how are we going to live there? So I present to you Asteria, named after the Titan goddess of fallen stars. Asteria is a module intent to maximize productivity creativity and health while on the Martian surface. Asteria has three main modules, which will be constructed, which will be inflated upon their arrival on Mars from the SLS rocket, and then constructed with cranes. As you can see, they have a general domed structure to them, even though they are cylindrical. The top and the bottoms are both dome-shaped. That is to equalize pressure throughout the unit to really ensure that um, everything is safe before the astronauts. There are three main modules, as you can see, and then there are smaller components such as connected hallways and um, smaller components such as airlocks in the greenhouse. So here we get into what the modules actually are. So we, the three main modules are the personal community module, in which the astronauts will get to rest and relax. We have the research and control module, which research will be conducted in. And then we have the systems and transport module, in which rovers will be stored and repaired. We also have the connecting pieces. These are hallways. We have our airlocks here. And then the greenhouse. Now, when constructing this habitation center, when constructing this area, we have to, we can't forget the humidity. We can't take the humidity out of the engineering. So we really have to consider the human factors. So this is why we created the double story module. It provides a large space for living, sleeping, and working, rather than creating some separate smaller spaces, which would really isolate the astronauts and not encourage group collaboration. We have just a select few larger spaces to really encourage collaboration and ensure that no one is isolated, as that is a big factor in um, team disunity. Psychological well-being is one of the most important things that we need to consider when design, designing our habitat and its layout. The five key factors that we focused on were isolation, <coughs> privacy, sleep, recreation, and time management. As you can see from the diagram on the right, our two <coughs> decided to have it be two stories to minimize the amount of noise that will travel throughout the habitat in order to increase the probability that our astronauts can receive adequate sleep. I would also like to emphasize the separation of this module and our research and control module. We did this specifically to separate work and recreation zones so that our astronauts can be more productive and have less stress. By also dividing these, we can balance time um, between recreation and work. We don't want our astronauts to be spending too much time working and become burnt out or not enough and become bored. So here's what a daily sample schedule for an astronaut on Mars might look like. They wake up bright early at 6 a.m. Um, next day we will have a DPC, which stands for a daily planning conference. They have two of these a day. Obviously, these are just to discuss the events of the day and do any work prep. Um, they have two exercise sessions a day. The first one, as you can see here, is at 8 a.m. It's about an hour and a half. They require two and a half hours every day to stay healthy and fit. Um, they have work time, as you can see, a break for lunch. Um, later in the afternoon, as you can tell, they have some public affairs events, which may just be video calls back home with Earth or any news and media kind of things. And then environmental sampling with seals. This is when they can go with rovers for EPA missions and basically do what they're there for and check out the Mars atmosphere and surface. Um, dinner, again, is time to relax and enjoy the multitude of entertainment options that they're provided with. And then at 9.30, they have crew sleep, where they get eight and a half hours of sleep. So a critical component of our Mars mission is safety. And therefore, we must protect astronauts from radiation on the Martian surface. An unproductive astronaut would receive 2.5 times the radiation dosage in the exterior of the ISS, and this is eight times NASA's average radiation limit. So we have to provide them with protection. There are three components to our radiation protection system. The first is shielding structure, and then warning systems, 
and this temporary shelter. Although we cannot get radiation dosage down to a zero, our goal is to get it as low as reasonably achievable. So the first part is shielding structure. So we built uh, the walls of our modules with radiation absorbing materials to protect the astronauts. The outer layer is made of boron nitride nanotubes. This is a material currently in development that's extremely effective at absorbing the high energy radiation off uh, the solar system. The next layer is polyethylene, and this provides our airtight component, while also its high hydrogen com uh, composition also absorbs radiation. Next, we have insulation, and this protects or this keeps all the heat inside the module. And then we have our water tank. So water tank or water is also high in uh, hydrogen atoms or high in concentration of hydrogen atoms, meaning that it's a great uh, radiation protective material. So this water tank will also provide all the water for our astronauts living on the module and protect them from radiation. Then we have our interior wall, and next will be heating pads. These heating pads use electrical resistance to keep the temperature inside the module at about 20 degrees Celsius, and they also keep the water tanks from freezing. The next component will be warning systems. So we will be using REM and REM2 sensors. And these are small devices that are plugged into uh, an astronaut's laptop, and they alert an astronaut of ex uh, excessively high radiation doses. Uh, the ISS currently uses three REM and seven REM2 sensors, and we'll, we will likely use a similar system. So now, if one of these detectors were to um, signal astronauts at high radiation dosage, they need an emergency protection plan. So inside our modules, the floor is actually a storage unit. So in the case of a solar vent, uh, the astronauts would remove all items from storage and climb into these compartments and put all the storage items over top of them to protect them from radiation. They would also put polyethylene shields over the windows. So this is our greenhouse. It's not really intended to supplement the astronauts in the food source because we don't know for sure what we can grow and how we can grow it, but it could help further uh, colonization efforts in the future. So as Zoe mentioned, we're going to be uh, constructing a greenhouse out on Mars. So we want to transform this arid surface and hostile environment into land fit for farming. So how do we do this? Uh, currently, there's aerogel sheets um, that mimic Earth's um, greenhouse effect. So what we would do is we would place this aer aerogel on top of some Martian soil. And because of its um, elements that it's made up of, uh, it's 99.8% air and 0.2% silica. What this means is that it will block UV rays as well as um, allow visible light to pass. So by blocking the whole entire Martian soil with this um, sheet, we will be able to um, raise the temperature underneath by 66 degrees Celsius, which can potentially melt subsurface ice, and this whole process would allow plants to be uh, formed. So if we can't use our greenhouse, um, we're going to uh, obviously transport all the food the astronauts would need all the way to Mars. Um, they require three meals and two snacks per day, and um, the daily micronutrients needed on the sh uh, uh, currently on the ISS per person per day is 56% carbs, 17% protein, and 28% fat. So we would be using weak hydratable food, so they would bring water separate from the food, and um, over there they would just cook it. And then to mitigate the effects of Mars gravity on the human body, we will be sending them with supplements. One of them is called Resveg Patrol, which is also known as RSV, and this is a common um, nutrient found in grapes and blackberries, which allows for um, cell, uh, bone cells to process and to be uh, produced at a rapid rate, so they will not be as affected by the Mars gravity. So for fitness strategies, um, exercise is critical for astronauts in order to maintain proper body composition while in reduced gravity. So the first three on the left are what are currently on the ISS. The first one is basically a treadmill, the second one is a bicycle, and the third one is um, for weightlifting. So the next two are specifically for space exploration outside of Earth's orbit, and the rocky one is the most, um, the newest uh, product. It's the resistive overload combined with kinetic yo-yo device. So this is basically about 65 kilograms. It's really tiny in size, but it allows for aerobic exercise as well as strengthen, strengthening muscles. I'm gonna be talking about the effects of gravity on our body. So on Earth, the, on our head, on our brain, the pressure is lower than on our feet. But on Mars, the gravity is 38% of that on, Mar on Earth. So if you can see on the diagram right there, the blood pressure is evenly distributed. So what the brain believes 
that our brain like has more pressure than it does, so it reduces it by 20%. So this causes fatigue, uh, bone loss, and just like tiredness. Okay, so I'm just gonna be talking about some medical equipment, so basic ones. Ultrasound is actually one of the most important ones. It measures 20, 250 medical conditions, and it has been used for on the ISF also. The X-ray is also used for basic internal scanning and structures. There will also be basic checkups, such as checking for vision loss in the fluids, and we will be providing them supplements such as antidepressants because they will be far from home and need to feel comfortable. And the goal is to be minimally invasive because we want them to feel not like we're protruding their body. The scientific objectives of Martian exploration can be framed within an overarching theme of searching Mars for past and present life, as well as determining the habitability of Mars uh, for human life. Within this framework, the Asteria mission will be conducting two different scientific assignments under geology and biology and climate studies. The first scientific assignment will be characterizing the geology of Mars. In order to do this, EV, or Asteria scientists will conduct EVA missions to certain exploration sites like Jezero Crater and the Mimi Fosse in order to understand the roles of water, wind, volcanism, tectonics, and magnetic materials. The second scientific assignment will be to understand the Martian climate. Scientists will conduct investigations on the generation of dust storms to answer questions like how are these storms formed and what are the dust particles in these storms made of. This will allow them to create detailed weather maps to ensure the safety of future missions. And they will study atmospheric pressure, temperature, humidity, and wind speed using the meteorological balloon, which is pictured below. Combining all of the different investigations one might do on the Martian surface, I designed a laboratory that would be located in the research and control module of Asteria. Some key components of the lab include laboratory benches, which would be used for scientists to investigate using microscopes, storage for all of our equipment, a telescope for viewing the Martian sky, and a loading bay, which would allow scientists to pull up a rover and easily transport geological samples for study in the lab. So although Mars's land surface area is roughly comparable to that of Earth, there are some extremely important differences that we had to account for. So the Martian atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide and extremely thin compared to that of Earth. So we have to account for these when we consider surface infrastructure and technology. So this is why we created these airlocks here. So they're really just to provide secure transitions in and out of habitation modules. So because the Martian atmosphere is so carbon dioxide full, we want the astronauts to be able to enter the habitation center, just wait a moment, and then try to enter the actual habitation center in order to maximize the efficiency of our ventilation system. Now these are connected ha connecting hallways. They serve a somewhat similar function to that of the airlock, as they're meant to section off each of one of the modules. So we do have the three main modules, but in the event of a fire, we have to evacuate all of the air out of the room and let it fill with carbon dioxide. So we want to be able to section these sections off and also ensure that there's enough distance in between each module that the fire cannot spread. Okay, so far from home, our astronauts are going to rely on environmental and controls and life support systems, or ECLIS, based on systems aboard the ISS, to provide for all of their life support. These are divided into five main systems. The water recycling system, the oxygen generation system, the atmospheric revitalization system, temperature and humidity control, and the fire suppression system. So here we're going to go through a quick rundown of how this works. The goal of ECLIS is to waste nothing, so everything works together. So the water recycling system recycles the urine into for, uh, potable water to be used by the astronauts and the rest of ECLIS. Some of this water will go to the temperature and humidity control to maintain a relative humidity of 60%. Some of the water will also go to the oxygen generation system. Here it is electrolyzed into oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen goes to the trace contaminant control system, where it is um, filtered into clean air to go to the astronauts. Um, these astronauts then obviously exhale carbon dioxide, so instead of wasting that, they are adsorbed by the four bed molecular sieve, which acts as a sponge, 
um, and brought to the Sabatier system. Here, the Sabatier reaction takes place, combining the excess CO2 and the excess hydrogen from the oxygen generation system to produce water, which is obviously very useful, and excess methane, which is the only disposed part of this nearly closed loop system, but it also has a potential usage in fuels. The last part of ECLIS is the biosuppression system. It is basically made up of portable fire extinguishers using carbon dioxide, photoelectric smoke detectors, and portable breathing apparatuses. Okay, I'm gonna be talking about waste management. So to give you an overview, there's two types. There's liquid and there's solid. And liquid includes hygienic water, and solid includes packaging clothing. So to give you an idea, a group of seven astronauts will produce about 9,500 kilograms of waste in 800 days. So you can imagine we can't bring that back to Earth because that would be very costly. So we have to figure out how to recycle it. How are we going to do that? Biogas is a new technology. It's under development. And it's going to recycle the waste and bring like, make it into gases such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and replenish our resources instead of having to bring it back on Earth. Here on Earth, communication is just a quick call away. But on Mars, it can be much more complicated. It can take around over 3 to 22 minutes to connect a signal from Earth to Mars. But every 26 months, due to planetary alignment and a solar conjunction, in which the sun is directly between Mars and Earth, there's a communication blackout. And no signal can be sent between Mars and Earth for up to 14 days. There are two types of communications, direct communication and relay communication. Direct communication uses radio signals, but it's a much slower connection. Direct communication allows an astronaut to directly contact mission control on Earth, but a high gain antenna will need to be installed on the Martian surface in order to make this connection complete. Relay communication is a much faster communication, but it uses a Mars orbiting satellite. An astronaut will send a high frequency signal to the satellite, and the satellite will relay that information to the Deep Space Network on Earth. The Deep Space Network is a collection of satellites that receive signals from deep space and send those signals directly to mission control. So this is our single story module. It's just meant to um, store the rovers and have a place to repair them if necessary. Um, it's a really simple structure. It's just one of the three modules. This is our rover access point. It actually differs from the habitation module. So this allows easy transport from the hab to the rover. So um, let's say the astronauts went on an expedition and they got some geological samples. This way they can just pull up to the side of the laboratory and it, um, import them right inside. So for our transportation on the surface of Mars, um, as you can see on the right here, we have a prototype of a hydrogen-powered lunar rover by JAXA and Toyota. JAXA is the Japanese space agency. This is obviously produced on the moon, but a similar prototype or similar model is actually really, um, it's a really good potential option for future missions to the moon. Rovers like these can seat up to four passengers. So in order to store and repair these rovers, there's a few things that need to be taken into account. First of all, for repairing these rovers, we plan on using either, either or both of these, a CNC printer and a 3D printer for metal parts and plastic parts. This is a great resource because it allows parts to actually be made on the surface of Mars, so there's never the fear of running out. We would also bring metals like titanium, aluminum, and steel, which are most prevalent in most rover designs. And again, on the right you can see this is another lunar rover model, but this one is actually much more suited to the Mars surface. These are meant for rocky terrains like Mars has, and would be very ideal for moving around on the challenging surface. So in order to power these rovers, we look at two different sources of power, the first one being a combustion engine. Um, the combustion engine basically uses a bipropellant made of hydrogen and oxygen, or methane and oxygen, and Essentially, hydrogen we would attempt to isolate from water found on Mars, and oxygen from its CO2 dense atmosphere. Here we have a fuel cell. This is actually a more profitable option for urban missions like ours. The combustion engine that was, you saw just a second earlier is a great option for later missions when we actually plan on colonizing or developing a more permanent development on Mars. But this fuel cell is really great because it uses hydrogen and oxygen that can be taken from Earth 
and a byproduct of this reaction is actually water, which can be used for astronaut consumption. So bottom line, power, mass, and cost. So one of our biggest constraints for Asteria was power. We were provided with two 10 kilowatt uh, nuclear reactors using NASA's new kilopower technology to produce a total of 20 kilowatts. Uh, after many calculations, we did end up using all 20 kilowatts with the primary drivers being heating and necklace. So in order to maximize our efficiency with our power distribution, we developed several power modes. So most of our cargo will be deployed and delivered autonomously prior to crew arrival. So during this time, we will have an auto deploy mode where all power is pretty much being spent on auto deploy. And also we will have to keep the, surf keep the habitat from negative 125 degrees Celsius to positive 20 degrees Celsius, which will require a lot of energy. So we have the heating mode for that. Uh, during the mission, we've also developed daytime and nighttime modes, as well as an emergency mode to account for extensive use of medical equipment. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. So one of our most challenging obstacles that we had to face um, during this lab um, and module design was weight restrictions. So um, uh, our total for our mission was a 60 metric tons. <coughs> And we had to make a categories, and then between that, we had to put subcategories, which would include um, equipment, lab equipment, as well as water storage and food supply and all of that stuff. Um, another challenge, uh, the, uh, the probably the biggest one uh, after um, weight, was cost estimation. Because this is a hypothetical situation, um, we couldn't precisely allocate a certain amount of money to every single thing. So we had to assume um, what percentage of the money that we got, the $25 billion, um, where we would place it and how we would separate it. So after taking uh, many algorithmic equations, we decided to use a parametric model and uh, it gave us that we would be using $17 billion out of our $25 billion budget. So the rest $8 billion would be used for any other expenses. Asteria. The cost-effective, safe, completely feasible idea for the future of a habitat on Mars. This is possible within the next 15 years with current technology or currently in development technology. A manned mission to Mars is necessary for the future of science and for and to make thousands of discoveries. In the words of famed Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin, Mars is there, waiting to be reached. You can go ahead and have the all of us. I want to thank Ms. Bagley and our mentors, Dr. Humble Mendel and Mr. Adam Noakes. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to combine engineering and the designing aspect and the research aspect. And we're going to combine that and we have a great time. So thank you for that. Do you guys have any questions? We 3D printed our habitation module. It's not always fun to go look at it, but yeah. John? <laughs> I don't think it did, <laughs> but um, on one of the slides it read that you were going to use the Ares 5 as a launch vehicle. So uh, while you guys spoke that you were going to use the SLS, so would you plan on using the Ares 5 if you could, or uh, is the SLS the option here? Um, the primary one is the SLS, um, but the Ares rocket would just be like a backup. It's just because the payload capacity. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you.
presentation is by the astronomy team. Good afternoon, everyone. We are the astronomy team, and over the past two weeks, we used asteroid photometry to study Eulia and to see what we could find out about its rotational period based on its flight curve. But at first, let's introduce everyone. Hi, my name is Sam Farrell. I'm from Buffalo, New York, and I'm a rising junior. Hi, my name is Akia Helm, and I'm from Newburgh, New York, and I'm a rising senior. Hi, my name is Quinn Langford. I'm from Round Rock, Texas, and I'm a rising senior. Hi, I'm Cecilia O'Brien. I'm from Dallas, Texas, and I'm a rising senior. Hi, my name is Lily Jumbo. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky, and I'm a rising junior. Hi, I'm Serena Shaw. I'm from the Colony, Texas, and I'm a rising senior. And our project mentor was Dr. Judith Reese, who is an astronomer here at UT Austin at the McDonald Observatory. Um, before we begin, I wanted to um, I wanted to say an important difference between like our project versus a couple of others. So instead of using like that fancy filtered data that you guys have been using from those pretty satellites about the raw stuff, you know? So photometry uses um, raw images and takes data from those images. So that's a little, a little unique aspect of our project. So yeah. Okay, so we're gonna start off with a brief overview of asteroids. Asteroids are mostly rocky bodies that orbit the sun and vary greatly in size. Most asteroids are found in the famous main belt between Jupiter and Mars, but there are various other asteroid groups um, that each have their own unique orbital patterns. Um, for example, up there in peak, you can kind of see the Hilda asteroids, which are a minor group of asteroids. Okay, so this is a plot of the inner solar system on June 5th, 2019. The red, green, and blue circles are all asteroids from the three main asteroid groups. As you can see, there are a lot of asteroids. However, in reality, the solar system is not this crowded. Even though there are about 800,000 known asteroids, their combined mass only equals about 4% of the moon's mass. The blue asteroids um, up there are the Trojan asteroids, which orbit 60 degrees ahead of and behind Jupiter. The green asteroids are the main belt asteroids, and the red asteroids are the near-Earth asteroids. These are the ones we focus on researching the most because these have the greatest potential to collide with Earth. So, the near-Earth asteroid of interest is the 15745 Eulia, and a more asteroid. Um, discovered in 1991 by Belgian astronomer Eric Walter Elps. As an amour, Eulia is a near-Earth um, asteroid and the second largest subgroup of near-Earth <coughs> objects. However, it doesn't cross paths with Earth's orbit, instead of being a lot closer to Mars. It orbits in a more elliptical um, orbit than planets, though, even though it's near Mars. Um, Based on its semi-major axis alone, which is this number here, um, you might believe that Eulia is always that far away from the sun, but with such a large, large eccentricity, um, it moves much closer during each orbit. Um, and the farthest distance from its focus of orbit, it almost, it's almost twice the distance between the sun and Earth. From one still frame, you can't see where Eulia is. Anyone can try to guess, but you can't really see it unless you know the coordinates or where to look in the sky. But when you see a collection of frames, you see it slowly move across. <laughs> These are examples of the frames that we had to, the raw images that we had to analyze. So as you see right here, Yulia moving across. So what are the tools and resources that you need for asteroid photography? <laughs> The first one is you need your images. So what images, how do we get our images? Um, we got our images from McDonald's Observatory. It's where our mentor works, and she took these images herself last year. Uh, these images were completely raw. Pretty much if you put a camera, like if you took a camera and pretty much put it up to a telescope, that's like basically what you can imagine we're looking at when we see our images. Um, After Image J is a very unique program. It was taken, actually, uh, it was based off of another program called Image J, 
which was a medical uh, tool that then was adapted um, based on like digital imaging. Somebody else saw uh, the way that this worked and saw that it could be used for the sky. Basically, the way that it works is um, you look at a light source, like a star or an asteroid, and you click on it. And there's a way, like, you can change around the aperture settings, uh, other techie stuff, but basically what it spits back out at you is how many photons are coming from this source. And a little bit more information about the photons as well. Uh, additionally, we were given three Mac desktops to work with. Each of these had uh, Astro Image J installed. We divided ourselves up into three different teams and kind of learned to work well together in those small segment teams. Uh, additionally, we used Horizon System, which is an online database. It tells you all about um, asteroids and other objects in space. Uh, and it gives, it's very, very precise. It tells you uh, the data at any point in time, um, almost to the second, maybe even to the millisecond. Uh, Google Sheets we used to share data, um, graph data, and store data as we were working through our project. And Google Slides is what we're using right now to present to you. Before we can do any measurements with our images, we have to calibrate them. We use the CCD camera and touch the telescope to take our pictures. A CCD camera basically uses light sensitive materials to convert that light into electrons. Generally, one electron equals one photon. Not all pixels are created the same, they don't have the same sensitivity, which is why a flat field accounts for these variations and gets rid of bits being wrapped like that. And dust particles may create donut shapes like this, but once we flat field it, Bias frames are all the background noise within the CCD camera. camera. We take a master bias frame, which is a median of multiple of them, and subtract it from every raw image to clarify. <coughs> okay, so apertures. Um, once we remove the uh, once we remove the bias from the images, it's important that we're measuring the objects as accurately as we can. So we do that by finding the optimal aperture. So an aperture is the opening in a camera where light enters, but when we're referencing an aperture, we're referencing the radius of pixels where we can measure the brightness. So we can, sorry, sorry. Um, we can use this equation to convert the number of photons into a magnitude of brightness. And so to find this optimal aperture, what we did was we measured three different stars in 20 images for each group, so around 60-ish, 60 to 70 images, um, with various apertures, and we plotted that against the signal-to-noise ratio information. So the signal-to-noise ratio is the ratio of useful, in, uh, useful signals to the total signals in the image, and so we tried to identify the maximum signal-to-noise ratio peaks in each graph, because that would identify the highest proportion of useful signals, and using that we could find the ideal aperture to use, which is typically around six to seven pixels. So after we found the correct aperture, it was necessary to correct for sky variation. So the star brightness in each of the images changes due to changing moonlight. So for some frames, the sky as a whole could be more or less bright. And to correct for this, we created a baseline by measuring 20 stars over about 20 images to identify which stars follow the same trend. So that was the trend there. And on the one below it, the black line would be an example of one that we would have to remove during this process because it does not follow the same trend as the others. And since the stars are constants that are not uh, dependent on each other, changes in the overall brightness must be due to the overall atmosphere at the time. And we use this set of reference stars to create a standard to which we could compare the asteroid to the true average brightness of the sky. So um, the data was split into <coughs> four different parts, each of which had its own set of reference stars. Um, as um, Serena, Serena had showed, we had to split it into three different groups and each group has a different aperture, and on top of that, different reference stars. So with all this different information, we had to patch everything together. So that separates everything into three groups. But on top of that, we had to split it again in the third group, because in the second group, because as Yulia crosses the sky, we had to change where the frame was going. So when that change happened, 
not only are the reference stars changing, but now it has to be common stars that aren't even going to be on, in all the frames. So uh, using a few common stars found in a few frames, uh, before and after the breaks between each frame, um, the magnitude for each of the four sections had to be increased or decreased um, along a trend line to find the um, an individual's, um, to find the actual light curve. As seen in this photo, um, we tried to patch things up using different um, methods, trying to find averages. This one necess wasn't necessarily the correct way to do it because it caused a lot of error. And um, we could see that because we used the standard deviation of our information and uh, found that no matter which way we tried to overlap things, it, there was some error because things were not necessarily going to line up and even though our best option had very little error, error, there's still going to be a lot because the patching process causes them. So let's rewind a second. What is a light curve? Why is it important? Why does it matter? Why should you listen to me? Um, a light curve is basically, if you look at this as an asteroid, asteroids kind of look like potatoes. So this asteroid, as it goes around, uh, it's going to spin in one direction along its uh, rotational axis. And it's going to reflect light back at you differently depending on which uh, part of the potato you're looking at. So maybe there's a bump in the potato at one point, and you can use that to um, like see when that bump comes back around. And one period of that, um, seeing that bump again, will tell you um, uh, like the rotational period of your asteroid. So basically, you look at a light curve to find the rotational period. And so, how do we find this light curve? right now. Um, we have four different sets of information. We have Serena's set, we have Quinn's set, we have Z's set, and we have Mean Cecilia's set. Um, and you can see those right here. One set, two, three, four. Uh, these are based off of the fact that we had different apertures, different reference stars, um, and we divided ourselves into these four groups. So we need to patch these and create one baseline for all of these. Uh, it should look like a wave, kind of like a side wave, but not really quite like that. Um, it's going to have two high points, very unlike a fine wave. Um, and so we found that the two high points are going to be about from there and there. And we realized that the data in the front um, from Serena's group probably had some error in the spreadsheet calculations. Um, likely we just put a minus somewhere where we wanted to put a plus. And it ended up in really messy data right here. Um, and we couldn't find the patch where it was. And we found out that like, other researchers who have studied this have also cut out that first information. So I feel like there's a lot of problems with that starting information. Um, so we cut out that information and then we now figured out, we put this um, new information without the starting bit into a program that should calculate period and it realized that our period is right around, actually this is not the right one, but it's right around three hours. So this, um, this asteroid is going to rotate itself every three hours. But when we looked online for other people's work, we realized that their information said that it rotates every 3.2 hours. So why is there this difference? Well, if you look back and forth kind of between the images, you realize that ours does work better with our, like our folded curve. Actually, I should explain what a folded curve is. A folded curve is, uh, we have more than one period up here. We have one and a half periods because it takes three hours to rotate, and we have 4.5 hours usable information. So what we did was we took that last 1.5 hours and kind of uh, translated it over back to the start to get this graph over here, where there's some overlapping data points like there and there. And what this should do is if the period is correct, it should look very much like a curve that's just kind of overlapping itself multiple times, like it does down here. If it doesn't look right, it should just look like a complete mess with no trend at all. Uh, so I think we did a pretty good job of making it look like a curve. Uh, and yes, there are. And this up here, the geometrical changes are greater than the patching error. This means that, yes, when we patched it all together, uh, when we brought it all to one baseline, that there were error, there was error associated with it, but the error was, uh, oh, that error was much greater than geometrical error. Uh, geometrical error is like, if I'm looking at a star, um, it could have, uh, if I'm looking at an asteroid, my bad, it, um, the light distance, uh, the distance away from it, when you translate into light hours or light seconds, 
can have variation on it, as well as uh, a bunch of other things, including angle away from you, angle away from the sun, a whole bunch of things. But we decided that when we looked at their Frieden's database, that the error from patching it is so much greater than the geometrical error. The geometrical error is very, very small that we shouldn't really have to worry about it. Um, and in summary, we found that our period is three hours. That's the big number right there. It takes three hours for this thing to rotate. Okay, like Sam said, we did a pretty good job finding our rotational period just using the light coming from a single point, but we did face other challenges along the way. One of them was learning how to use Astro and J. Reading a 41 page, size 12 font, single space technical manual <laughs> was quite a lot, but we spent a day learning the technical functions we needed to process our data. Another thing we struggled with was organizing our spreadsheet. With so many people collaborating, we had to keep track of where all the specific data points were and what they were for and if they had already been calculated, and that could have caused some error along the way. Learning how to convert protons into magnitudes took a lot of calculations with massive amounts of data, repeating it over and over again. And learning how to correct for orbital geometry was something we also did using the database for horizons for some help. Finding what images to keep and toss was another challenge because on the day that Dr. Reeves took the images, it was a little bit cloudy, which messed up some of our images and made them hard to measure, which is why we had to
different planets and um, where they existed. <coughs> so uh, just to reiterate, um, this is what happened. We had some raw data. <laughs> uh, we had some white dots on a black page, and then we had 70 of those images. We did a lot of clicking and a lot of calculations, ended up with something generally like that, and you know, it, it was just so raw, yeah. The data was, yeah. <laughs>
Um, but we were the sunshine in our lives every single day. <laughs> Texas. Um, I'm Pascal Hugh from Albania. I'm Katie Hart from San Antonio, Texas. 
Brian Rubio from El Paso, Texas. I'm Connor Phelps, I'm from Houston, Texas. I'm Assistant Army, I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm Alice London, and I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, and we're the International Space Station team. What are the main jobs of astronauts while they're on board the International Space Station is taking photographs of the Earth. Every day, they downlink this data to White Sands in Mexico, and from there, it gets distributed to different groups at NASA, such as ISAG and ESRS. Each day, anywhere from 50 to 200 images get distributed to these NASA organizations. And because so many of these images are received daily, there's currently a database of over 3 million images. To put this into perspective, Dr. Gregory Chamatoff, the astronaut that came and spoke to us last week, said that while he was on board the ISS for six months, he took over 20,000 images. These astronaut, pho astronaut photographs are vital to research efforts done by scientists both in NASA and outside of it. Astronaut photographs are unique in that they can be taken from many different angles because it's with a physical camera as opposed to just a satellite image. And because of this, they can provide many different angles, but also different lightings, as they can be the same feature can be photographed at different times of day and at different seasons, which can which can be very good at showing the change of something throughout a short period of time. So down here are two images of the Rykoki volcano in Russia that erupted this past June, and this is the same eruption, but one is a satellite image and the other is an astronaut photograph. And as you can see, they both provide useful data, but the astronaut photograph shows the height of a plume, of the smoke plume from the volcano, which is something that the satellite does not show, which would be helpful for scientists trying to study this eruption. And to provide some specific examples, astronaut photography has been used to study tidal flat loss in Japan, the effects of elephants on vegetation in Botswana, and to measure the aerial fluctuation of the Great Salt Lake. Now, while astronaut photography is very helpful and can be a great resource for studying the Earth. There is currently a database of 3 million images, and the large majority of these images aren't categorized or organized in any way, which can make them nearly impossible to find and use for studies. Yeah, as, as Alice mentioned, uh, these astronaut photographs cannot be applicable to science unless they're organized by their features, and it isn't, pra it isn't uh, practical to make humans do it because there's just too much data. So the most efficient way to do it is to use machine learning. It's to automate the process of machine learning. Um, machine learning is something that we're seeing more and more nowadays. For example, your smartphone talking back to you, or your bank knowing whenever someone's committing credit card fraud on your, on your card. Um, machine learning was based on the human's anatomy of the human brain, which is why um, the models are called neural networks. So this is a basic artificial neural network. It basically is programmed to allow the, the computer to learn, to learn like a human would. Um, it's typically written in data science languages like Python and R. And um, it, how it works is it takes it, it, it takes uh, an input layer and it puts it through secret hidden layers right here, and it spits out an output layer. But how it actually starts learning is it, com it computes epics, which start from the other way. And this is called training. So it trains the it trains the model to learn how to use these mathematical operations to get the right data. So every time you train it, you increase its accuracy right here. And so this is what we're actually working with. Uh, what, this is what we're talking about is object identification, conv convolutional neural networks. So what happens is here is you need a lot of data to make this work. Or if you don't have a lot, of, the more data you get, the more accurate you can get. So how this works is there's a 224 by 224 pixel image, which is shrunk down from the astronaut photo photograph into that. And it's encoded with RGB, as you can see in this three right here. Um, then it goes to mathematical operations, similar to our previous you know, network. These mathematical operations are convolution, and that's the type of math that uses matrices. Um, and so it's called convolutional you know, network because that is the dominant mathematical process that's being used here. So it, it goes through these processes and it gets pulled into these conversions. So the first one here we can see is the edge and blob, and it will look for that in the image, and then we'll look for textures, object parts, and finally, object classes. So these object classes are what is being looked for, the feature in the image. So 
object, object identification con convolutional neural networks are extremely useful if they're given a lot of data and they can uh, accurately and more quickly organize after product photographs and human scans. Human scan. So what we worked on was kind of uh, like the middle ground of what they were talking about. So we have this large amount of data that we can't really use and then we have a neural network that's been designed that doesn't have data. Um, so we worked with a website called Feature Hunter, which is aimed at identifying geographical features of interest in pictures that are taken from the ISS space station. Um, so how Feature Hunter uh, kind of works is it uses uh, something called Citizen Scientists, which is just a more fancy name for people who volunteer uh, for NASA uh, online. And what they do is they would, they're given a picture <coughs> and then they would identify uh, what, where the geographical feature is in that picture and then they'll put a bounding box. And then that picture will be saved with the bounding box uploaded to uh, some place that is stored. And then that will be run through the artificial intelligence to try to correctly identify it in artificial machine learning. So. Um, and so just some quick, well, uh, what we did with this um, uh, website is we designed a tutorial uh, for how to train people to like, correctly identify the features so we don't have false data uh, in the machine learning algorithm. Um, so also a quick fact, uh, only less than 5% of the astronauts photographed have actually been identified, so there's a lot of data. Just like Connor said, we have worked on an overview tutorial and nine separate tutorials, one for each feature. Uh, while working on these tutorials, we came across some issues. So when we originally made them, we put too much description into them. So they came out really lengthy. So the way we fixed this issue is we reviewed each other's work to shorten the text and make sure the tone is consistent through all the tutorials. Another issue that we ran across was that we had difficulty agreeing on a final format. So we spent a total of two days agreeing on a singular format out of the many formats we had created. And the final major issue that uh, occurred for us was the limited communication between us and our mentors at the Johnson Space Center because they weren't able to come see us in person. They did, however, make time for us by communicating to us through an app called Edmodo and a video chatting website called Zoom. And now Katie will showcase the overview tutorial. So here we have the feature on our website, and this is the opening page, and now we'll show you the tutorials that are actually live and implemented. So whenever they go to the website, they get a brief description of what Feature Hunter is before they scroll down to see our tutorial. So the first page of this tutorial talks about why we need citizen scientists, as well as what they will be doing on this website. We then teach them what to do when they're first given an image. And the first thing we want to know is if a feature is even present in the image. So whenever they decide, we tell them what to do if they do see a feature, if they're not sure if they're seeing a feature, and even if they don't see a feature. And we let them know that the use of all three boxes is vital to getting a well-rounded set of training data. Once they see a feature, we teach them how to draw bounding boxes, as illustrated by this kid here. So we also talk about, when teaching them how to draw bounding boxes, what is acceptable and what's not. So when we're trying to train these machines, there's actually a range of data that can be useful. It's not just black and white. So we want to let them know ideally what we're looking for and what a good bounding box would be. But we also want them to know that this is acceptable too. There isn't just a right or wrong answer. But at the same time, we teach them that this is not going to be useful and actually will hinder our efforts in training the machine and increasing the accuracy. We also detail specific instances in which case there might be two examples of the same feature in an image, and multiple bounding boxes will be required to capture the entire glacier in this case. We also tell them what to do if we see multiple features within the image, so different features, that is. So in the instance of a river running through a city, we're gonna want the machine to box both the river and the city, and so we teach them to do this by changing the category. Finally, we arm them with a little toolbox that they can whip out if they are confronted with a difficult image. So in all of our pre-work tasks, we were asked to kind of be example citizen scientists and practice drawing bounding boxes. And these were a few things that we kind of struggled with sometimes. Clouds can obscure the view of the image, and so we teach them what to do in case there are tons of cloud cover. And they're also 
photos taken from unique angles, um, in which case you see the curvature of the Earth. And so while sometimes that makes for a very pretty image to look at, it can be hard to figure out how to draw the bounding boxes. And so we tell them what to do there. And again, we remind them that a good training stack comes from using not sure and no, as well as yes. So we remind them that it's okay if they don't see the feature there. It may not be there. And the last thing that we do before sending them on their way is tell them that their work is important. You know, astronaut ph photographs are used in a wide variety of research, but nothing can come out of it if they're not organized. And we also want to let them know that their work is important so they feel motivated to put forth a good effort and give us accurate training data. So once they've completed this overview tutorial, they will go down and select one of the nine feature options that we have, where they will receive a feature-specific tutorial that I will talk about. So if we go ahead and click on one of the features, the user will immediately be presented with a set of uh, pictures of, for example, what islands might look like and what the optimal boxing for each of them is. <coughs> the reason why we put this little page here is so that when uh, the user scrolls below and is actually identifying the features they're working with, they can easily uh, um, access this um, reference um, page here. Uh, we aimed for a short and concise tutorial, so if you look on these tracking lines below, um, we did that, we made it only four pages long. And in those four pages, we include uh, what islands or any specific features are and what, in what ways they're hard or easy to identify, along with some strategies to make this identification easier. Uh, we also inform the users of what is good set of training data for, in order for the machines uh, that are learning from this program to use, what is acceptable, and what is not useful as an input. And in the end, we have a short interactive which simply asks the user to identify uh, a feature for practice. So I'm going to ask the app, um, audience whether you see an island in this picture or not. Yeah. No. Not sure. Alright, <laughs> so I, I heard the not sure in the audience and all of the other answers, so if you press not sure, you can press any of the other answers, it's just that uh, not sure is more, uh, I wanted to focus on this answer. Um, there are actually islands on this image, but they might be difficult to, uh, to make out because of clouds coverage or the illumination here from the sun and the sea. Uh, but we make sure to let our users know that a not sure entry is much more relevant that the, the, than, a, than a fake yes. Uh, so that would actually obscure the data which the, which the machines will be working with. Our time with the project has come to a close, um, we have to look forward to what we have to do in the future. So the first thing that we have to do is actually get people to work on the website. These are what are called, like uh, Connor mentioned before, citizen scientists. This can include middle school students, high school students, and college students. The next thing we have to do is to create a model to be built and trained using the data we received from Feature Hunter so that features can be identified. Because features were identified in Feature Hunter, it will help the AI or the machine learning to identify the rest of the 3 million photos. The last thing we would have to do is to take measurements in regards to accuracy in order to see how good the machine learning is done and how it can be improved. Below, you can see a machine learning um, machine learning learning curve which shows how quickly it gets up to, up to a human's accuracy. Um, the last thing that can be done is to create a login system to introduce game and competition to the website. We would like to take the time to thank some people for allowing us to work on Feature Hunter. Um, first off, the Earth Science and Remote Sensing Division at Johnson Space Center, um, especially to Alex Duncan for taking time out of his week this week to come help us with the presentation. Um, we would also like to thank Eddie Ramos for being um, our on-site supervisor here at CSR and helping us these past two weeks. <coughs> and we'd also like to give a huge thank you to Ms. Baggio for organizing this program and allowing us to be here and helping us through everything the whole way. 
Um, and you've really impacted us, and we really wanted to kind of share with you some of the experiences that we've had that have made this experience so special for us. So my, my experience as an SC intern has been very worthwhile. And um, I found that the work that we've, that we've done so far and the future of Feature Hunter to be really exciting. And I'm so happy and thankful that I got the opportunity to help develop it. Um, I also have met some great people. I've met connections with my fellow interns, uh, my mentors, and I really enjoy that, that part of it. Also, I found CS has helped me prepare me for what career I want to go to. Before I came to CS, I thought maybe I want to be a computer scientist, a businessman, maybe an engineer. But I never had any professional experience with either of those. Or, I mean, any of those. But after CS, I see what NASA sci NASA engineers do on a daily basis, and it really inspired me. And I also learned about what higher level higher level computer science looks like, even the niche of machine learning. And I am excited to get to work on machine learning, and I'm really passionate about it. And yeah, thank you, Cs. Um, so I think Cs was very worthwhile. Uh, they not only just exposed me to this uh, cool internship um, opportunity, but it also allows me to see like what NASA does now. I mean, whenever I thought of NASA before this, I thought, oh yeah, they went to the moon, but they have like a really large. So one thing that I really liked to learn about this week that I was exposed to um, was communication in the real world. Um, so the seven of us really worked on the um, aesthetic look of the tutorial, you know, what the layout wanted, we wanted, interactive, whatever. But we also had to communicate with the more technical aspect, um, with Ian Babin, who's actually coding all of these onto the website and dealing with all the technicalities and whatnot. And so we had to go through some give and take of what Ian was like, well, you know, this might be easier. For example, the dashes that Ava pointed out. We had originally had those as dots. Um, and Ian was like, well, it's actually easier and built into the code to use dashes. And so there's just that kind of give and take. And it was really unique to see how communication works between two very different groups um, on the same project. For me personally, the NASA internship was my first internship. <coughs> had, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And it have really set a high bar for any future internships that I'm going to apply to. And I've personally learned that I can work with people that I've never met before because I previously thought I wouldn't be able to work with people I didn't know beforehand. One thing I really loved these past two weeks was the wide range of topics that got covered. So we were working on feature hunter and astronaut photography, but in the presentations we got to learn about Mars and Grace and ISAT and all those other projects and things that NASA does. And that was really cool for me to see the different things that NASA does and also find new things I'm interested beyond just space. All right. In all honesty, it was mental, this <laughs> internship. So uh, we learned a lot more through this program that was actually needed for a specific project. Um, we had the opportunity to work here with scientists who have pre previously worked with NASA on their uh, satellite and space missions. We met a rocket engineer, an astronaut, and for a girl from an obscure place on the other side of the planet, life's good. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, before this internship, I believed that I would just go into computer science and maybe in some sort of engineering. But now I've um, seen all of the, well not all of them, but a broad amount of STEM jobs that I, that I can pursue in the future. We have time for one quick question, if somebody has one. Um, so when you actually get the data from users, how do you like? Do you have any database integration that you have to do? Where is it all stored? Um, so yeah, the, at the Johnson Space Center, they have servers there which collect the data, and they'll store the boxes and all the information, and that can just be plugged right into their uh, their uh, machine learning model. Well,